can you tell us what's happening? Where is the state headed? Well, it's headed to oblivion. And people are leaving to go to places that are what once was known as hell, hot Texas or desert Nevada, that have become paradise in their mind. And we took paradise and turned it into hell. So they're leaving. It was very hard to destroy California, given it's got huge amounts of timber, minerals, oil, natural gas. It has, I think, four of the top universities rated of the top 25 in the world, Caltech, Stanford, USC, UCLA, UC Berkeley, four or five. So it was very hard to destroy that inheritance, but we did. And how do you quantify that? You can use almost any measurement you want. If you use fuel, we have the highest gasoline prices in the United States, partly because we don't develop our own oil or natural gas, partly because we have blended fuels that give marginal cleaner air but are very expensive, partly because we have the highest gasoline taxes in the world, in the, excuse me, in the United States, partly because our regulations are such refiners don't want to improve and expand. If you look at homeless people, we have almost half of the nation's homeless people. We have one-third of the nation's uh, welfare recipients. 27% of the, of the state residents were not born in the United States, so that posed an enormous challenge of integration, inter assimilation. We didn't do that very well. Uh, our school test scores are around 45, um, rated out of 50. We used to be in the top 10. Uh, if you look at taxes, we have the highest income tax. I think the governor is now going to sign into a bill 14.3 on top incomes. Highest gasoline tax and our sales tax, given the local and county add-ons, is among the highest. And so people then ask, and we have the, what do we get in return? And, and when you look at the schools or crime, Cal uh, San Francisco has the highest per capita uh, property crime rate in the United States. Uh, Los Angeles is now one of the most violent cities statistically. If you look at housing uh, per square foot, these homes that you see out the window run between a thousand and fifteen hundred dollars per square foot, about eight or nine times the national average. If you look at the price of electricity, it's 27 to 35 cents a kilowatt hour. It's unaffordable and it's non-reliable and it's dangerous. The, the grid is ossified, so if you live in the foothills or dry areas with October, November winds, the power lines snap and then you get these raging forest fires in the Sierra Nevada or up in the northern part of the state or even in the Los Angeles Hills, or especially in the Los Angeles Hills. So it's it's sad because when you combine the Sierra Nevada, the Central Valley, the beautiful 600 mile coast, it's one of the most beautiful, fertile, natural places in the world. And under bipartisan leadership with Pat Brown and Ronald Reagan, George Duke Mason, Pete Wilson, even Arnold Schwarzenegger, there was a consensus that if you're going to grow, you have to have infrastructure. So you built dams and aqueducts. And at one time, I know this sounds crazy, but the 99 freeway was not the most lethal per mile driven freeway in the, in the United States. It was one of the most modern. So was uh, 101. So was LAX. So was SO. But they've just, they just calcified. They, they were not developed. Uh, commiserate with population increase. So the, the operation, operating theory in California is uh, if you don't do anything, they won't come. So if you stagnate the infrastructure where it was in 1970 for 16 million, 17 million people, maybe 21 million, then it won't work for anybody else. And if it won't work for anybody else, they won't come. But they did come. They came from very poor areas of the world they, because what the leadership didn't realize is that a stagnant California that was aging and its services, its infrastructure was eroding, looked, still looked like paradise to people in Central America or in Vietnam or in Africa. And so they flocked here and they needed enormous help. State services, I think Medi-Cal has gone from 7% of the budget up to 30 or 40%. 
And so it's just, meanwhile, there was a war on the upper middle class, the entrepreneurial class or the middle class. And they decided that you look at what you pay, look at what you get in terms of protection, security, schooling, infrastructure, freeways, price of gas, price of electricity, and it's not worth the bargain to be in paradise. So they leave. But do you think there's going to be a point where people will see what you're saying? Or are they seeing that already? Yeah, they're seeing it already. So let's take a normal community that's not hard left progressive, say Fresno County or Kings County or Tulare County, where I live. If you go to an August, average August afternoon, it's about 108, and you will see people go into the local Walmart, and they're not going there to purchase things. They're going there to find free air conditioning because they can't afford, even at subsidized rates for being poor, they can't afford to turn on their air conditioning because the rates are so high. The rates are so high, deliberately so, so that people will not use air conditioning. And they're set by people who live here. Notice in this office, I don't have any air conditioning. Which we're in Stanford right now. Yes, okay. we're at Stanford. And so the people who set policy, whether it's on electric prices or fuel prices or the school system, they're never subject to the consequences of their own ideology. None of those people over there at Google or Apple or the state legislature, uh, Nexus, or this very wealthy corridor from here to Berkeley and back. None of their kids of the elite go to private, to public schools, and yet they're the most adamant against charter schools t and the most supportive of teachers' union. So do you think these elite that you mentioned that live in these areas, do you think they control the state policies? Yes, absolutely, because of the money. What happened in the 21st century, there were particular people in the bi-coastal area, the east and west coast, the one looking at the EU, the other looking at Asia, who had marketable global skills. So they woke up on some magical date and they discovered that their markets were not 300 million people, but 7 billion. Now the lo what they called the losers, the deplorables or the irredeemables or the chumps, they were the people that had muscular jobs. And if they were in assembly or manufacturing, they were outsourced or offshore. They were called the losers. But this area, whether it's Facebook, Apple, Google, Twitter, uh, or Stanford University, they expanded exponentially all over the world. And seven trillion dollars of market capitalization comes into this area. It's the greatest concentration of wealth in the history of civilization. And that created among the people who participate in those, and they're monopolies. Google, I think, controls 90% of all searches. Twitter uh, and Apple have the same type of uh, asymmetrical monopolies in their particular fields. The, the people who control that then control the politics because they fund it. So if Gavin Newsom is going to be recalled, they pour money in. If in 2020 it looks like uh, there's a chance that Joe Biden might lose. According to Molly Ball of Time Magazine, Mark Zuckerberg infused $419 million in pre-selected precincts to absorb the work of the registrars. And so that's how they use their money, because the pr operating principle is that the skills, the insight that made us anointed financially and globally have given us um, a birthright, so to speak, to dictate to everybody what they should be doing with the understanding that sometimes it might not work out that like we thought, but we're protected by our money and our influence, and they run the state. The money explains their, why we have a one-party state. That's not exaggeration. There's not one state Republican office holder. Uh, they control, they being the, and it's not the Democratic Party, it's the hard left. They control both the state Senate and the state assembly. And I think they control all but 11 congressional seats out of 53. So it's a one party Confederate system. Now this group of elites that you mentioned that are here with, with a lot of funds, do you think that they, they probably are not gonna benefit from where the state is headed? 
because some of these companies are moving out to go to Texas and other states. What are your thoughts? What do you think is going on in their minds? Up until the last two years, their operative narrative was, we're going to change the state and we're going to let all the water that was committed to agriculture go out to the sea for fish restoration. And that's not going to affect us because we can always buy imported. We're going to shut down the timber industry because we feel it's more natural to have wildfires, to clean out the forest. And when a dead tree falls down, we don't want a logging company going in there and cutting it down. That's not natural. And so that doesn't affect us. And we don't want to tap our enormous reserves of oil or natural gas because we have enough money to pay 30 cents a kilowatt hour and we don't drive all that much if we do our jet, private jet <laughs> system minor expense. However, the last two years when we have one of these rare moments in American history where the hard progressive left actually controls the entire government, and by that I mean the U.S. Senate, the U.S. House of Representatives and the President, and there's no impediment, impediment to that. And then they look at the consequences and they think, my gosh, we've destroyed immigration law. And there's a lot of people around here that come, came up, they don't know how to drive, they, they get in wrecks and they just leave the scene of the accident. Or, my God, all of the people that are coming out here are not like Herlinda, my maid, or Juan, my gardener. They, they, they bring problems with them, and there's so many of them. Or they'll say, or, and I've talked to them, so I'm not just exaggerating. Or they feel that crime now, with all of uh, the George Soros sort of caricatured district attorneys, we had Boudin, Gascon, that means that they're following people home to Beverly Hills and robbing them, killing them. In one they're going into Malibu, they're coming out here into Atherton. How dare they do that? So they're starting to see just a little bit that when you destroy civilization, even with all of your enclaves and wealth and private security, you can't protect yourself. And they've pushed diversity, 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 and all hiring and applications. And now, not among the very multi-billionaire elite, but the upper, upper, upper elite, the multi-million, their children are not getting into Stanford or Berkeley, and they'll think, I, but I'm for diversity. I'm, but when you go into repertory admissions, so you take a particular ethnic group and you don't match their numbers in the population, but you say, given the systemic racism of the country, we're going to let in, instead of 12% of this group, 16%. Instead of 10% of this group, 12 That has to come from somewhere. So it comes from white males, and not all the white males can give $10 million donations or athletes. So it's starting, that's another example of their ideology coming back to bite them, despite their enormous leverage, prestige, influence, and wealth.